Kicking off the list at number 10, Ghost Spider. Coming from Earth 11638, AKA the perfect world, okay. This Peter Parker has a much brighter beginning, meaning Uncle Ben never actually passed away and gave the whole great responsibility speech. Instead, he encourages Peter to become a stronger Spider-Man, which sounds good on paper. It sounds like the ideal world, but does he recommend protein shakes and proper exercise and nutrition? No, see Uncle Ben pushes Peter to abduct Spider-Man from other worlds and then absorb their life force via this portal that Parker Technologies created. So he's a bit of a dick, this Uncle Ben. He's not really the nicest guy. Maybe he's fine. I don't know. This whole system seems a little bit whack. Now, eventually, Earth 616 Spider Man shows up. They both hear about each other. It's interesting because Uncle Ben poisons our Peter, and then he wakes up confused, and they fight it out. And our Peter Parker comes out on top, luckily, with the perfect, amazing spider getting his soul sucked into that machine. Now, the perfect Spider Man spirit was then trapped in the underworld like hell, and then from here, it only gets more strange. Well, well, rather it gets more Banner. See, Banner was the current Sorcerer Supreme at this time, so he ended up freeing Peter in his astral form, but then Peter absorbed all those spirits of the damned while he was down there, so when he came back up, this perfect spider was now Ghost Spider. Number nine, Old Man Spider. Ezekiel Sims from Earth 4, AKA Old Man Spider, took over the web-slinging spot after Peter Parker lost his life to Moreland. Now, Ezekiel first appeared in Edge of Spider-Verse issue five. He was actually recruited by Spider UK, who I'll talk about a little bit later, to go against Moreland and the Inheritors. Now, Ezekiel rescued Ben Riley and Kane from the Inheritors, which is awesome, and then a bunch of other spider beings were then recruited, but Deimos tracked them down and snapped this Spider-Man's neck. He caught him off guard. Brutal. And in his last words, he revealed his true self and told Peter to protect Silk, aka the bride. All that matters. What a beautiful last sentence. We love impactful last words here at Top 10 Nerd. It's the best. Number eight, Spider UK. Here he is, Billy Braddock himself. I told you I'd talk about him. He began his life as Captain Britain, actually, before he was webbing people up. So he's actually rocking both teams. He's a busy guy. He's on the Captain Britain team and then the Spider Army. He made his first appearance in Edge of Spider-Verse issue two over on Earth. Earth 833. Now, this Spider-Man is one of my favorite versions. His arc is so fun. He can hop between dimensions whenever he chooses, and then after the defeat of the Inheritors, spoilers, he keeps an eye on Earth 3145, and then during the Spider-Geddon storyline, in issue two, Spider-UK dies in an explosion, and it's buried in England on Earth 803, the home of Lady Spider, who loved the idea of Spider-UK being buried in the same cemetery as her parents, because she loved him. Loved him like a brother, of course. Brother zone, even after your death. He's down there like, really? Okay. Number seven, Spider-Man. Literally, this gets a little gross. Now imagine if Spider-Man had more spider than man when he was bit. That's what happened to Patton Parnell when he first entered comics in Edge of Spider-Verse issue four. See, Patton lived a pretty dark life. He lived with an abusive Uncle Ted. He would perform horrible experiments on animals and he spied on his neighbor, Sarah Jane. So it's not a healthy system that he's got going on here in any way, really. One day, Sarah Jane and Patton went to Alcorp Industries in hopes of freeing all these test animals, but that's when Patton saw this red brain radioactive spider. He was like, mm, I want to touch it. And then he did, got bit, and then got kicked out. Now, overnight, he didn't get jacked. His vision didn't get better. He wasn't webbing up Dr. Peppers and lamps. When he got his abilities, he started eating everything. He ate a mouse, and then he ate a cat, and then when Uncle Ted walked in, he was like, what's up? Now, this version is, of course, extremely powerful, but he's also extremely dark. We love the balance. We love balance. Number six, Spider Cyborg. Coming from Earth 2818, this version is a dark future Spider-Man. I mean, look at him, of course there's some sort of future-ness going on here. He made his first debut in Superior Spider-Man issue 33. Now it's Peter Parker if he got cybernetic additions. It's badass, that's basically all it is. His one eye can zoom in, go all tactical, the claws can certainly leave a mark. And one of the most remarkable features, um, his arm cannon, his sonic arm cannon, that's definitely a plus. Now before Karn came to Earth 2818, our Superior Spider-Man warned him, and then when Kane finally did show up, Superior Spider-Man and some other webbed friends joined the battle. His left eye being a red lens is actually a nod to his appearance early on in the 90s in Spider-Man issue 21, titled Dealing Arms. Number five, the Scarlet Spider. Ben Riley first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man issue 149 as a clone. He was part of the whole clone thing that went on for way too long, way too long. But it wasn't until Spider-Man issue five that he was 
was introduced to readers as the Scarlet Spider. Now the Jackal created the clone using Peter's DNA and he was made to fight Peter of course. He's like hey you can't beat him just clone him. Now the two were fighting it out in order to save Ned from a bomb and then when the clone seemingly died he was soon buried after but the thing is the Jackal injected him with something earlier so he could survive something like this. Of course! course. So for the next five years, he thought of himself as the useless clone that came back to life, then gave himself the name Ben Riley. So depressed. Perhaps one of the better elements to come from the clone saga was Ben Riley. One of the few things. Number four, Spider-Man 2099. Ah yes, the not so near future. 2099 Spider-Man, aka Miguel O'Hara is the current web slinger over there, and his outfit is one of the more memorable ones. His DNA was biologically mixed with a spider's DNA, so it's a little bit different than our spider bite scenario that we have. Now he worked at Alchemex and was pressured by the company to test genetic coding. And after Mr. Sims didn't make one of those test runs, just went horrible, Miguel was then poisoned by Tyler Stone with a fatal drug named Rapture, so Miguel ended up relying on the so much that he couldn't quit his job. How brutal is that? It's like every McDonald's employee. It's like, yeah, you want free nuggets? Yeah, sign in tomorrow. You're not going anywhere. So Miguel ended up relying on the so much that he tried to genetically fix himself and fix his body. Now, of course, this had a brighter turnout than expected when Miguel inherited Spider-Man abilities plus telepathy. Must be nice. Number three, the Spider. Earth 15 Spider-Man, simply referred to as the Spider, comes into comics during the Exile storyline issue 12. Now he was another Cletus Cassidy, pretty much. I mean, he was a red-haired psycho who had no problem taking out innocent people. So when the Spider symbiote came along in this Earth, it merged with Evil Peter, who was sentenced to not one, not two, but 67 life sentences from a jury. Okay, so he's bad. He was a big part of the Weapon X team and he had Deadpool's sense of humor too, which made him just that much more evil. Now in Exiles issue 44, he was finally stopped by Firestar when she hit him with a mega blast. He was later buried in the prison cemetery, so even after death, you're still doing that time. Number two, Miles Morales. Of course, we gotta talk about him. He made his first appearance in Ultimate Fallout issue four, just a couple months right before the death of Peter Parker. Now this is a crazy time because Norman Osborn was just arrested and revealed as the Green Goblin and while Miles was visiting his uncle Aaron, an enhanced spider crawled out of Aaron's bag, bit Miles, and Bob's your uncle. You know the rest. Now, he got these amazing Spider-Man abilities, but he could also camouflage himself almost fully invisible. Plus, Venom Blast will help get the job done, that's for sure. The new PlayStation Spider-Man game is way more fun with these added abilities. Makes it way better, so I had to put them on this list and talk about them. Especially if we're talking about abilities. Hold L1 and just punch someone's chest through the wall, you're like, yeah, this is great. And finally, number one, Cosmic Spider-Man, AKA Captain Universe. This Spider-Man is one of, if not the most powerful alternate version of the Web Slinger. Cosmic Spider-Man went toe to toe with Rune King Thor and came out on top. So if you're not sold now, just get out of here. Actually, don't get out of here. Watch the rest of this video. Don't even say that. Never mind. Cosmic Spider-Man is from Earth 13. He retains the powers of the Enigma Force and he first appears in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3. Issue nine. Cosmic Spider-Man can't leave his universe or else he would lose the Enigma Force. That's why the resistance of spider heroes were based in Central Park of Earth 13. They're like, hey, no sweat, we'll come to you, no problem. We don't mind the commute. <laughs> he meets his demise only a couple issues later, sadly, when the inheritors were hunting down Spider-Man and their leader, Solus, drained the Enigma Force from him. But we can find more of him in What If Volume 2, Issue 31, titled What If Spider-Man Had Kept His Cosmic Powers. Number 10, Rancor. Rancor is the descendant of Wolverine who hails from the Earth of 691. She first appeared in the original Guardians of the Galaxy series in issue number 8. When she was just a teenager, she battled her own father and defeated him by clawing out his heart. Yikes. She then took over the planet Haven and decided to take prisoner the human population of that planet, turning them into her servants against their will. She would cross paths and play villain to the original Guardians of the Galaxy team initially, but they would end up defeating her, this time around at least. Her powers are similar to Wolverine's, being that she is his descendant. Ascendant. As a ruler, she also has other warriors at hand who are willing to fight for her, although she herself is also a capable and skilled fighter. Number 9, Albert. Albert was an android created to destroy the real Wolverine by Donald Pierce. He came from a kind of wacky time in comics and also worked with LCD, another android who resembled a little girl. Like I said, it was an interesting and strange time. In the end, both LCD and Albert would go rogue, deciding not to complete their mission as they developed their own free will and thought and decided that eh, they didn't want to die. In killing Wolverine, they likely would have been forced to self-destruct, which they just were not into. Albert the android 
has powers very similar to Wolverine, though he doesn't self heal. But hey, he's an android, so he can be rebuilt or patched up in most cases if he's harmed. He also has the fighting prowess to almost match Wolverine of 616, almost, and also possesses a genius level intellect, supposedly. Number 8 Wolverine Earth 811 the Wolverine of Earth 811 is interesting as it has been implied that his powers, while similar to the version of Wolverine from Earth 616, could have actually just been a result of human evolution, with him potentially being a descendant of a small group of ancestors known as the Moon Clan, who hid when the Celestials first arrived at Earth, avoiding any of their genetic experimentation. Despite these potential origins, Wolverine was still considered a mutant when the Sentinels took over as he hails from the reality of Earth 811. And of course, Earth 811 is the reality of the Days of Future Past. He was the Wolverine to help Magneto rescue Scarlet Witch, but unfortunately she died during that attempt and Magneto ended up paralyzed from the waist down. Wolverine would go on to join the Resistance and become a leader among them. So he not only brings with him his own abilities, but influence over the Resistant forces located on his Earth in his reality. Number 7 Jimmy Hudson Jimmy is the son of Wolverine from the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610, though Jimmy wouldn't know he was Wolverine's son until his mutant powers manifested. His powers are similar to his dad's, but Jimmy is also bonded to one of the poisons, a kind of symbiotic alien creature that typically takes over their hosts. However, after their leader died, Jimmy found a way to control his poison. While bonded to his poison, Jimmy also has spider-like abilities and can shapeshift, turning his claws into tensile, goo-like tendrils or extremely elongated spikes. Whatever he prefers for the day. Number 6 X24 X24 was a clone of Logan made to defeat the old man version of him and recapture the clones who had escaped. He was powerful enough to take on both old man Logan and Laura Kinney at the same time. And Logan pretty much dies trying to fight him in the end, and X24 is even then only killed after X23 is forced to shoot him with an adamantium bullet that Wolverine was actually saving for himself to end his own life. X24 is one tough dude in this movie. He is a version of Logan whose rage is more tapped into and unleashed. What's more, he was engineered to be comparable to Logan in terms of his power level, but in peak physical condition. Considered to be like Wolverine, but as he was in his prime. Number 5 Gorgon I always forget that Gorgon was also Wolverine, but him being one of Norman Osborn's dark recruits and carrying the mantle would definitely make him one of the most powerful alternate versions of Wolverine around. Because Gorgon Morgan is a pretty powerful and deadly guy. Even if, as we learned during the Otherworld Tournament in Ten of Swords, he isn't immune to the seduction of rock sirens. Gorgon is a masterful fighter and a powerful mutant who also has the ability to turn his opponents to stone, hence his name. Gorgon. He is a deadly force to be reckoned with, and I personally feel bad for all of the folks who have to challenge him whenever he's working security for the mutants of Krakoa. A lot of those people just are getting maimed left, right, and center. Ugh. Number 4 Dokken Dokken or Akihiro is a deadly member of the Wolverine family, who spent his time as Wolverine when he was on the Dark Avengers. It was during this time that Dokken attempted to take the Muramasa blade for himself to boost his power. He planned on having it bonded to his skeleton and coating his claws in it, and he wanted it so he could basically go kill Romulus. Remember Romulus everyone? Whatever happened with that? He was successful in bonding the Muramasa blade to his claws, but didn't get to hold on to that power permanently. He would go on to battle and defeat both Scar and and the Punisher, in fact seemingly killing Frank Castle, who would then go on to become Franken Castle for a time. One of Dawkins' most powerful abilities is his pheromone control, which can allow him to alter his opponent's mood. This is actually how he won against Scar, using pheromones to calm Scar down, which caused him to then transform and transform in a way where he was just more chill. Number 3 Laura Kinney Despite not even being an exact clone of Logan, X-23 is still one of the most powerful versions of Wolverine around out there. She became Wolverine in the all new Wolverine series. Even today, it's more the mantle and look that Laura is known for, with both her and Logan currently using the same name, Wolverine, on Krakoa. So there are two Wolverines technically within the same continuity now. More recently, Wolverine was chosen to go on a mission in inside the vault, along with Darwin and the resurrected Sink. The three were brought in to do so because of their extraordinary abilities and the fact that Sink could, in effect, use both of their powers himself. As we saw in issues 18 and 19 of the 2019 X-Men series, time moves differently in the vault. And in the end, the mission ended up taking, for them, hundreds of years before they actually managed to complete it and get out. But despite aging, Laura did not slow down. Even in the old woman Laura future, 
disorder where her cells were beginning to break down due to her being created originally from genetic engineering, Laura still proved to be a badass, using her last bit of time alive to defeat Doom and free the people of Latveria. Basically all around, X-23 is just like the best. She's so cool. Number 2. Dark Claw Dark Claw is a combination of Marvel's Wolverine and DC's Batman, hailing from the Amalgam Comics universe. So yeah, you know he's OP. He's not only got a powerful regenerative healing factor, but is a master fighter, martial artist, and detective who also happens to have super enhanced senses. Imagine a master detective who is also a master tracker. There is no crime or mystery that he could not solve. Dark Claw is also known for being hyper intelligent besides, so he's basically got the whole package. He's also super wealthy in this reality as well, so he's got money to back up his vigilante antics, helping him to acquire high level tech and giving him access to various different gadgets, as well as his own claw copter, which this character has in place of a Batmobile. If you're both Wolverine and Batman, does that mean you just have like unlimited plot armor? Because I feel like both of those characters can never die just because they're so popular. So I feel like Dark Claw would be pretty unstoppable. Number 1. Old Man Phoenix Obviously one of the most powerful versions of Wolverine around has to be the one from the alternate future of King Thor, Earth 14412. Here Wolverine goes on to become the Phoenix after seemingly dying along with everyone else on Earth at the hands of Loki. The Phoenix however chose him and because of that he lived again and was given an unimaginable amount of cosmic power. Logan mostly used this power to fend off villains including Ultron and Loki and to keep the space stone out of Loki's hands. Many years later as Old Man Phoenix, he would team up with King Thor to protect the Earth from Doctor Doom after it was given new life again. Doom in this reality was also immensely powerful, and although Logan could not be killed in battle, he chose to sacrifice himself to give Thor the power to defeat Doom, imbuing his hammer Mjolnir with the Phoenix Force. However, even after seemingly giving up his life here, he would still somehow end up being resurrected. Because Phoenix. Number 10, Casper Cole. Casper Cole is now known as the White Tiger, but initially we knew him as an alternate version of Black Panther in the 616 reality. Casper Cole was created by Christopher Priest and Dan Fraga, and first appeared in the 1998 series of Black Panther in issue 50. Kevin Casper Cole was a police officer who was itching to get a promotion and decided to start wearing a Black Panther suit he'd come across while working the beat in hopes that it would give him the edge that he needed to win said promotion. Instead, it only helped to bring him into the direct line of fire by his crooked lieutenant, Sal, who aimed to have him killed. Fortunately, the suit protected Casper and saved his life. He was fired from the force, but would continue to operate as the vigilante Black Panther in NYC, working to take down his crooked lieutenant. Casper would be given a synthetic version of the heart-shaped herb, which grants him his super-powered Black Panther-like abilities, and he also possesses, of course, all his training and skills learned from his job as an officer. Number 9. Earth 11080 Shuri This alternate version of Shuri also becomes known as Black Panther. She first appears in Marvel Universe vs. The Punisher issue number 1 and hails from the alternate reality where a viral outbreak turns the world's inhabitants into feral, mindless cannibals. Sort of mindless. Kind of like zombies, but not zombies, because we already have an alternate Earth for that in Marvel, Earth Z, or Earth Z, if you will. Although Shuri's fate remains unknown in this reality, what we do know is that while she was around, the feats that she seemingly accomplished, trying to protect the uninfected and scientists searching for a cure, were pretty impressive. It's unconfirmed that the Punisher kills Shuri, though it is left slightly implied in issue number four. We get like a flashback, and he's like looking at her while she's killing Bartrock, and it's like, mm, <laughs> he might be coming for her next, I don't know. Number 8. Ultimate Black Panther Ultimate Black Panther kind of got a weird story in comparison to the main continuity version, but this was a world where we were trying to push the envelope and try new things. So I guess this is what happened. And they definitely did that with T'Challa. While T'Challa is a king who is known for both his strength and his wisdom, often using his words and speeches to help his people, and currently the Avengers diplomatically in the main continuity, in the reality of Earth 1610, T'Challa instead lost the ability to speak when he fought a panther in order to prove himself, and ended up having his vocal cords badly damaged and pretty much ripped out. His father made a deal with Weapon X in the US to fix his son after he was severely injured in that panther fight. They fixed him up 
up and also gave him new abilities including an improved healing factor and adamantium claws, but he would not regain his ability to speak. He would also receive training from Captain America. However, T'Challa would also kind of become a prisoner in the US when Fury claimed that because they had fixed him, they got to keep him and basically use him as their hero. Um, I don't think that's how that works, but I guess if Nick Fury is saying he can do it, it's gonna happen, so yeah. Do not mess with Ultimate Universe Nick Fury. Number 7. T'Chaka T'Chaka is the father of T'Challa and was Black Panther before him. While he might not be quite as much of a genius as his son T'Challa or his daughter Shuri, T'Chaka still has a brilliant mind when it comes to tactics, diplomacy, and leadership. Like the Black Panthers who would come after and who came before him, T'Chaka had also ingested the heart-shaped herb, which granted him his superpowered abilities, including super strength and super speed. T'Chaka was also in peak physical condition and was an extremely experienced and skilled martial artist. Number 6. T'Chaka 2 or T'Chaka the Second. This version of Black Panther comes to us from The Exiles Volume 2 out of 2009. He made his first appearance in issue number one of that series. T'Chaka the Second was named after his grandfather and is the all powerful son of Storm and Black Panther from the alternate Earth of 1119. We haven't seen too much of him in the comics, but it's safe to assume he has the powers of Black Panther, despite him going by the alias of just Panther. And he's likely an all around formidable fighter and leader, being the son of two very powerful heroes. He also packs a mean Wakandan nerve pinch. Gotta love that. T'Chaka the Second was created by Jeff Parker and Salvador Espin. Number 5. Queen Shuri Shuri would go on to become the Queen and the Black Panther after T'Challa slipped into a coma in the main reality of Earth 616. Shuri has always wanted to become a fierce warrior ever since she was a child, and she is prepared to take on that role. Not only did she prove to be a great warrior, but she was a strong leader who refused to lay down arms in the war against it. Atlantis, just as her brother had before her. Shuri not only has the power of the heart-shaped herb, but her soul would travel to the Dejalia, and there she would receive extra training and, when she returned to her body, have extra abilities and powers as a result. So not only does Shuri have all the skills she developed herself growing up, but she also now can turn into a bird or birds, possesses a rock form, and can travel to the Dejalia plane and even reanimate the dead. So pretty powerful. Number 4. Ngozi Ngozi comes to us from the alternate reality where after getting in the midst of a super powered fight, she ends up becoming imbued with the powers of Venom and of Black Panther. She was originally a Nigerian track star who was left unable to walk after a severe bus accident. When Venom was fleeing from Rhino and then went on to kill Black Panther, the symbiote ended up finding her and bonding to Ngozi. Brave Ngozi was able to convince the symbiote to help her in defeating Rhino and the Dora Milaje were so impressed by by this show of strength and bravery that she was appointed as the new Black Panther. Number 3. MCU T'Challa T'Challa in the cinematic universe was an extremely skilled warrior, but also should be well known for his perseverance in the face of insurmountable odds and his sense of honor. These are the main things that I think made him so strong and made him stand out as a ruler. But also, that impact suit though. The suit of course was a gift from Shuri in the MCU, so in a way it also just goes to show how strong the whole Black Panther family unit is there. While they don't touch on it as much in the MCU, it's also believed that T'Challa still has the genius level intellect that he is well known for in the comics, and that he is a master strategist and tactician. Which would make sense considering he's likely been trained since birth for his role as ruler and as Black Panther. Number 2. Ghost Panther This alternate version of Black Panther comes to us from the Warp World reality, as with all the creations on Warp World, he is a combination of two souls two characters, Ghost Rider and Black Panther. Warp World was created when Gamora used the power of the Infinity Stones to fold the universe in half, merging together everything within it, so we got these sweet, sweet combination characters. Ah, I love it. T'Challa here possesses the powers of both of these heroes. He was a Wakandan prince who was exiled for his arrogance, and ended up becoming a motorcycle stuntman, taking up the show name Johnny Blaze. When an accident left him close to death, he was made an offer by 
by Zarathos, great power in exchange for becoming her servant. T'Challa refused, but would later accept Zarathos's offer under different circumstances after learning his father had been murdered. Number one, Killmonger. While T'Challa is an amazing ruler, has a brilliant mind, and is an impressive, unstoppable fighting force, Eric Killmonger from the comics has received a lot of power ups over the last few years that would probably put him above MCU T'Challa, I would say. Eric has ingested the heart shaped herb and lived to tell the tale, despite not being of the Royal Panther tribe bloodline and basically being put into a coma because of that. He's also gone to outer space, ruled the intergalactic empire of Wakanda as Emperor Killmonger, been resurrected, and been given even more strength, and also has bonded with a symbiote of Clintar. He is the definition of an overpowered villain. Number 10, Christopher Welland, or a kid spawn as I like to call him. I don't know if that's like an actual term that we've ever used, but yeah. Christopher is one of the lost souls who is kept within Spawn's heart. He acts as an ally to Spawn and later goes on to kill the serial killer. Billy Kincaid. His story is that he ended up dying but was preserved by the Man of Miracles, who promises, while appearing as the Green Lady, that he will save Chris and one day return him to his mother. Save. Save. <laughs> it's not quite what happens, but still. The Man of Miracles keeps his promise, and his mother is then able to move on with her life, getting the closure she needed after her son's death. So he saved him more to just be like, He's still around and you can move on now, but he's still dead. But either way, Chris would be needed by Spawn, and so the Man of Miracles sent him there. Christopher has some of the powers of a Hellspawn and is able to use his costume as a weapon and save Spawn by helping him to remember his true identity. Christopher first appears in issue 150 of Spawn, and he's got a pretty interesting story arc if you want to check it out. I think you should check it out. It's pretty interesting, in my opinion. If you think the things that I think are interesting are interesting, you should check it out. That's what I'm gonna say. Number nine, Chibi Spawn. Chibi Spawn appears in the comic Spawn Kills Everyone, a story featuring the Chibi version of Spawn attending what appears to be San Diego Comic Con. They refer to Hall H, so yeah, to discuss a new Spawn movie being released. He is super confident that his movie will blow every other superhero movie or TV show out of the water. But when he comes up against patrons and cosplayers attending the con who don't seem to acknowledge his greatness, he kills them in cold blood, echoing a scene out of Deadpool. He even makes a comment about his victims being dead in a pool of blood. Get it? Dead pool? Dead pool. Dead and pool are also very largely printed. Ha 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 ha. Comic jokes. His most powerful moment, though, is probably when he goes on to take out his own creator, Todd McFarlane, who he kills for insisting on how cute Chibi Spawn is. For some reason, I want to say that Todd McFarlane is actually not the creator of Spawn and that I said that name wrong. I wrote it just from my mind, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. I'm questioning everything. I feel like it's because there's a few McFarlands in the world, is there not? Who's the other McFarlane? Seth. Seth McFarlane. He's the one that makes all the shows and his family guy and stuff, right? Are Todd McFarlane and Seth McFarlane related? That would be so weird. I don't think that's a thing. Number eight, Hellspawn. Hellspawn comes to us from a spin off series and is technically Al Simmons, but I'm almost certain features a version outside of the main continuity. I'm pretty sure this is outside of the main continuity. Hellspawn was a series written by Brian Michael Bendis and Steve Niles, with art by Ashley Wood and Ben Templesmith. It offered a much darker look at the world of Al Simmons and the enemies and victims he would be involved with. Pretty surprising, really. I mean, how much darker? can Spawn get, you might ask. It's already a pretty grim and often disturbing world and series in terms of the various events and villains depicted, and just how metal it looks. Like, it looks really metal. Can we all agree? I think we all agree on that. Well, you need to check out these alternate adventures for the character to really find out just how much darker it is. Even the artwork should give you an idea of how much darker this take from the early 2000s was. I mean, just look at this art. It's literally dark. It's very dark. We're talking Marvel's runes levels of dark, friends. Number seven, Medieval Spawn. Medieval Spawn was Sir John of York in life, a medieval knight. He made his first appearance in the Spawn universe in issue number nine of Spawn. Medieval Spawn would go on to team up with another badass in a Witchblade crossover in 1996. Oh yeah, Spawn and Witchblade, two awesome badasses. 
characters. Medieval Spawn would team up with the medieval Witchblade, if you will, Katarina Godliff. How fitting. He helped fight alongside Katarina during the invasion of the elven world of fairy. Both he and Witchblade banded together to defend the realm and fight off the invasion. Image also released another team up later on, titled Medieval Spawn and Witchblade, though this version is quite different, with Medieval Spawn being known by the name of Leith in life, or Lythe, who became ensorcelled and betrayed his king, and the Witchblade being a young girl named Starling, who finds the artifact and, who it's implied, comes from a long line of witches herself. Medieval Spawn only ranks so low because the original version from the 90s at least happened to walk into a trap laid by Hellspawn hunter Angela while he was still getting used to his role as a Hellspawn. Don't worry though, Medieval Spawn still lives on despite being slain as he's since been resurrected. Which I feel like happens a lot in Spawn, people getting resurrected. Number 6. War Spawn Captain Thomas Coram was an English soldier and his ties to Al Simmons family later down the line, but before any of that transpired, he also fought in the First World War. War Spawn made his first appearance in issue 179 of Spawn. We later learned that he had a secret love affair with an African American woman, which was considered taboo at that time in history. They had to hide their love, but his paramour Selma ended up leaving after having their child Michael. She basically couldn't deal with the fact that they had to keep their love a secret, and she was like, Tell me you love me or I'm gone. So she left. Michael would eventually grow up to become a soldier and ended up serving in the First World War under his father's command. Unable to stop Michael from joining the army, Thomas promised Selma that he would keep their son safe. It was after Michael died that Thomas made a deal with male Bolgia to become a hellspawn in exchange for his son's life. Michael's family line would eventually lead to Wanda, Al Simmons' widowed wife, who was therefore Thomas's descendant. Haha, -ha, the connection. Number five, Gunslinger. Gunslinger is one of the most popular of the alternate hellspawn to exist. He made a deal in exchange for getting revenge for his murdered family back in the day. Gunslinger spawn is Jeremy Winston, who before he married his wife was a preacher. For the most part, he was a peaceful sort, referred to by the nickname of Old Job. But after the death of his family, he made a deal with the fallen angel Mammon, and became Male Bolgia's servant. He got revenge for their deaths, but also killed every single person in the town, except for one, which Mammon had forbid him from harming. Gunslinger spawn made his first appearance in issue 119 of Spawn. Number 4, Lord Covenant. Before the spawn of the medieval ages, there was the Dark Ages spawn. And if you thought medieval spawn was dark, wait till you meet this guy. He went by the names Black Knight, Dark Knight, or Lord Covenant because his name is Covenant. You get it. He was originally a well-respected ruler named Ian Covenant, who went to go fight in a holy war, seeking redemption for having an affair with his sister's most lovely handmaiden. I don't know why I added that qualifier, most lovely, but she was lovely, so I just call it like I see it, I guess. However, during his time away, he would die and end up making a deal with male Bolgia that he didn't fully understand and later became reincarnated as a Hellspawn. This version of Spawn first appeared in Spawn the Dark Ages, issue number Number one. Number three, all new She Spawn. While Nyx was the first one to take up the mantle as She Spawn, Jessica Priest wears the moniker now, and she looks good while doing it. Jessica Priest wears the moniker and the looks of it now, and boy does she wear it well. Jessica Priest is one of the world's greatest assassins who would end up being recruited by Jason Wynn and, in a twist, be the actual person responsible for killing Al Simmons. Aha! At least we think so. That whole part of Al Simmons' backstory has kind of gone all over the the place, truth be told. Retcons galore over there. Jessica, when she was just five years old, ended up admitting to burning her house down with her parents inside and was found roasting marshmallows on the fire when the police came to get her. Yeah, that's the kind of level of crazy assassin she is. She believes it's her responsibility to take out all the jerks in the world, which is why anytime she's been released from prison, it usually results in her killing a bunch of people. There are, after all, a lot of jerks out there in the world. Recently in the comics, Jessica resurrected Nyx after finding her dead, and in so doing, also somehow became the new She Spawn. Number two, Cogliostro. If we're talking about willpower and smarts, Cog has to be one of the most powerful versions of Spawn around. Cog was a Hell Spawn who refused to give up his life to male Bolgia once his powers were drained. To avoid this, he always held on to one last sliver of his power and refused to use it until he could find a way to free himself. Cog became the mentor of Al Simmons when he first returned to the world as another Hell Spawn. Long ago, Cog was known by the name Kane and has had many other famous names throughout the years 
including Faustus and Merlin. Cog is the same Cain, by the way, from biblical lore, the first killer who slew his brother Abel. His greatest ambition in life was to rule hell, which was what he also did when he betrayed Spawn in issue 120, seizing the crown of hell for himself. Number 1 Omega Spawn, or Lord Omega. This is an alternate version of Al Simmons himself, one much darker and much, much more powerful than the original, at least at a glance. Omega Spawn was a version of Al Simmons who was given unlimited necro power and reign over hell by both Melbolgia and Satan, and he is from another alternate reality, if you will. Recently, he is mentioned in Spawn's universe in issue number one, where it seems he has some plans for all the spawns running around in the universe. And if you're wondering how he got here, he was uh, sort of dead, but then brought back to life. So he's back again, and he was also brought over to the main continuity. So yeah, that all happened if you were out for a while. That's what happened while you were out. In Spawn's universe issue number one, he has those who serve him set it to capture and confine these other alternate spawns. Well, including original spawn, who's not really an alternate. And as for the alternates, it's Cog and Gunslinger who are up in uh, being imprisoned. Fortunately, Spawn and the Gunslinger get away, but time will only tell what Omega Spawn is planning and what he wanted the other spawns for. Number 10, Thor of the Thunders. Thor of the Thunders is also known as the man named Donal, an old man who hails from the reality of Earth 311, the world often referred to as 1602, which was created by Neil Gaiman and Andy Kubert. Thor of the Thunders was the godlike form that Donal took upon slamming his artifact, a wooden stick, to the ground. The doom of this reality attempted to steal this magical artifact, but was unable to do so, as he dismissed the stick, which Donal then used to transform into his Thor form. Thor of the this reality is believed to be the god of storms, thunder, lightning, and agriculture. His very existence is considered very controversial considering the time period and the power and beliefs belonging to the Catholic Church. Number 9. Thunderstrike Eric Masterson might not be around in the comics anymore, but when he was around, eh, he was pretty powerful. He became merged with Thor Odinson for a time and at one point replaced him as Thor as well. Eric was considered worthy enough to wield Mjolnir, but is also also known for his own specific weapon, which also inspires his superhero name of Thunderstrike, based on the Thunderstrike Mace. Eric died before he could even fully comprehend all the power that the Mace offered. One of the most powerful abilities it granted though, in my opinion, was that of teleportation, allowing Eric to open up portals to anywhere he chose, even allowing him to travel to other dimensions, or possibly alternate realities. Transdimensional travel capabilities are always super OP to me, especially when they come from a time period where they weren't as clearly defined, meaning that they could basically be as limitless as the story required. Them's the best time for crazy powers. The times when we didn't have to define anything. Number eight, Asgardian. Billy Kaplan as Wiccan is definitely ramping up to be one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel multiverse. But before he was known as such, he went by a different name and style. When he was just starting out as a hero, Billy was a member of the Young Avengers and inspired by Thor, took up the mantle of Asgardian. Guardian, styling himself as such. The name didn't end up sticking and only lasted for a few issues before he decided to change it to Wiccan in issue 6 of Young Avengers, which more suited his magic based power set. However, it is important to note that Asgardians are known for being tied to magics as well. So while Billy was just starting out and the name didn't last long, in a way his magics do kind of tie him to the Asgardians, who are also sometimes known for being mystical. They are mystical mystical, cosmic, and mythological, but it depends on the story as to which aspect is more highlighted. Billy, as Asgardian in this Thor Styles, is really only being ranked so low for his lesser ties to Thor, but power level wise at this point, he's pretty off the charts. Number 7, Groot Thor. Groot Thor is one of my favorite alternates. He appeared as one of the members of the Thor Corps on Battleworld. Other than the reality of Battleworld, we don't really know exactly where he comes from. He could even perhaps be a combination of two alternate characters, for all we know. Anything is possible on the patchwork world of God Emperor Doom's Battleworld. Groot Thor, however, possesses the combined powers of both Thor and Groot, presumably from Earth 616, which would make him pretty crazy powerful as both of those heroes are capable of great feats. So 
combine their abilities and you get one strong and capable character. Groot Thor ended up joining up with Jane Foster, who is also Thor, in the rebellion against God Emperor Doom, whom the Thor Corps originally worked for. Instead of only saying, I am Groot, he instead only speaks the phrase, I am Thor, which makes me laugh. It's great. I love Groot. He's one of my favorites. Number six, Rune Thor. Rune Thor is one of the alternate Thors who appeared on Battleworld as a member of the Thor Corps. His fellow Thor ended up turning against him after they realized that Rune Thor had turned pretty evil and was killing all the alternate Jane Fosters and Donald Blakes that he could find. Rune Thor proved powerful enough to beat and eventually kill as a result of his injuries an alternate version of Beta Ray Bill, also part of the Thor Corps, who was known as Stormbreaker Ray. Rune Thor, however, would also be taken down in the end by another member of the Thor Corps who was investigating the case involving the missing persons. The Janes, the Donalds the missing persons. Number five, Ultimate Thor. Thunderer Thorleaf, as he was known during his battle world days, was the one responsible for defeating Rune Thor and killing him in the end. This version of Thor initially forgot who he was, and for a while in the Ultimate line, he was just a nurse by the name of Thorleaf Goleman, who believed he was human. In the end, however, Thor would begin to remember Asgard, experiencing what others believed were delusions. Even readers thought he might actually be going insane, and we weren't really sure if he was really Thor or if it was all in his head, but later on it was revealed that he was in fact the real deal, the Norse god of thunder and the real Thor in the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610. Thor was established as one of the most powerful characters in the entire ultimate universe. And even when he doesn't have his innate powers, which would later be restored to him by Odin, he has his EDI biomechanical suit to back him up, which grants him abilities and attributes similar to his godlike ones. Number four, Goddess of Thunder. Jane Foster has been known by many different heroic mantles. One, she is a doctor, which kind of makes her like an everyday hero. That's like an everyday hero mantle. And two, she is currently a Valkyrie and was one of the last Valkyries besides. Well, until the return of the Valkyries, which kind of semi-randomly happened during the King in Black event. But in between, Jane Foster was known as Thor, taking up the mantle after Thor Odinson was deemed unworthy during the original Sin event. In many ways, Jane was considered to rival Thor in power, and at times even bested him. She also took up the mantle despite having cancer in her human form, and despite the fact that transforming into Thor basically canceled out the effects of her chemo, meaning that her cancer was only getting worse and worse from her transformations. So even though it was killing her, she was like, I'm still going to be Thor. And man, you gotta, you gotta respect Jane for that. That's pretty crazy. Number three, MCU Thor. The Thor of the Marvel Cinematic Universe became so powerful that he didn't even need to have a hammer to use his power. This is a Thor who realized the power was inside him all along in Ragnarok, and despite becoming bro Thor in Avengers Endgame due to, well, his depression surrounding losing Asgard and then being unable to defeat Thanos, still was immensely powerful throughout that film. In fact, the Russo brothers confirmed in a post on Reddit that Bro Thor was no weaker than he was previous to this state. And he remained super powerful, but he was just going through some, some stuff at that time. In Avengers Infinity War, Thor was able to restart the forge at Nita Vialir with the help of Rocket, doing the unthinkable and holding the iris that focuses the neutron star within the forge open himself, which meant he himself was hit with the star's powerful energy. Thor held the iris open long enough to ensure the top of Stormbreaker at least was forged, which when you think about it and you talk about it, it's kind of weird. But when it happened in the movie, you were like, oh, that's nice. Number two, Beta Ray Bill. Beta Ray Bill deserves a lot of respect for just how powerful he is. So powerful, in fact, that even Odin was forced to recognize him after he bested Thor in combat. This happened back when Thor, being separated from his hammer, turned him back into Donald Blake. Remember those days? While he was separated from Mjolnir, Bill managed to get his hands on Blake's cane and summon Mjolnir's power for himself, being deemed worthy to wield it. This prompted Thor and Beta Ray Bill to battle over who should possess Mjolnir, and Beta Ray Bill was actually the victor of that fight. However, despite winning, and despite the fact that the fight was to the death, he decided to actually spare Thor's life. 
Odin decided to acknowledge his power, seeing how great of a warrior he was, and made him his own Asgardian weapon to wield moving forward, known as Stormbringer. Also, Scuttlebutt. I just like saying the name of that chip. Scuttlebutt. It's a good name. Number one, King Thor. One of the most powerful alternate versions of Thor, hands down, has to be the alternate future version from Earth 14412, King Thor. This isn't just because of his power as ruler of Asgard and Allfather, a power which Thor would actually rename as the Thor Force once inherited, but this version of Thor has also bonded with and wielded the all black Necro Sword, and was also known for a time by another more powerful name and mantle, King Phoenix. This happened after Wolverine relinquished the Phoenix Force and thereby his life to supercharge Mjolnir and helping King Thor to defeat Doom, because that's basically what he needed. He needed the Phoenix Force to do that. Never fear though, after Doom was defeated, the Phoenix Force managed to later resurrect Logan, because uh, that's how the Phoenix Force do. So even though Logan was like, I give up my life and my power for you, Thor, he's still gotta come back after. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Dawnbreaker. This version of Bruce Wayne first appeared in Dark Days The Casting, Issue 1, residing in, of course, the Dark Multiverse on Earth-32. The story picks up with the usual Bruce Wayne origins. His parents are both taken out by Joe Chill that night, but here, young Bruce Wayne comes into contact with a Green Lantern ring. So Bruce approaches Joe, and he's pretty pissed at this point. He's going for blood right off the bat. He ended up turning Joe Chill into bones and dust. And then when Bruce met Gordon, they got off on the wrong foot initially as well. Gordon greets him and he's like, ah, Green Lantern, wasn't sure you'd show up. And then Bruce straight up's like, hey man, don't, uh, don't threaten me. Really awkward vibes, just quick awkward vibes right off the bat, no friendship there. He was taking out Gotham's villains super quick. Each time he did it, he would scream and yell about how much his parents deserved to not be dead. He flew the penguin into outer space. That's, that's how you handle a guy right there. You take him and you go, right off planet. Okay, so with all of these brutal assassinations, the rest of the Green Lanterns knew they had to come and put a stop to this madness. Only it wasn't that easy. Bruce destroyed all of them. He actually the entire Guardians of the Universe. Beware his power, Dawnbreaker's might. Number nine, Speeding Bullets Batman. There's a name. This Elseworld storyline showed us what would happen if Kal-El's ship did not crash land in Smallville, but rather it landed in Gotham. So when the inevitable did happen and his parents were attacked and killed that night, Bruce Wayne, real named Kal-El, used his alien powers and unwillingly killed the robbers. His powers just came out in the form of heat vision. Toast, they didn't make it at all, no chance. And after this point, Bruce Wayne wasn't the same. He was ruthless, he had the powers of a god and so much anger, guilt, and pain inside. He had no idea what to do with this. So he would just repeat over and over, the bullets, the bullets, the bullets. Like he was in bad shape mentally. He hid from the world in his mansion of solitude and he couldn't even look at photos of anything related to death as it was super triggering. And then one night, a group of robbers tried to invade said house, but again, heat vision wins this round. Didn't make it. A little older and a little wiser, Kal-El decided that now it was time to use his powers to get the job done, help out, you know, be a role model. He took up the identity of the Batman, but still, just because he rocked the cape doesn't mean he was doing all the right things. For example, when Lois Lane was kicked out of Lex Luthor's limo later on, she was about to be attacked by thugs, but Batman came in and burned their flesh while splintering their bones. Or you could fly, fly them to jail or vaporize their eyes, that works too. You can vaporize their eyes, that's sure, that gets the job done. Number eight, Dark Claw. Veering out of the dark multiverse for a hot minute, we have to talk about Dark Claw. Coming from the Amalgam universe, where DC and Marvel combined powers, literally, we get a Wolverine Batman mix. He first appeared in Legends of the Dark Claw issue one back in 1996, and his origin story is a hot mess. At just age five, Logan Wayne witnessed the death of his parents, the usual stuff, but then he was sent to live with his uncle in Alberta, Canada. Better bring a jacket. It's cold. His uncle too bit the bullet after poachers ambushed him. So Logan Wayne enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force when he was of age and shortly after was submitted into the Weapon X program. 
so much amalgam fun. There Logan got the adamantium treatment, but the Weapon X program was terminated because it was deemed a failure. Why you ask? Logan Wayne still retained his conscience. So where to go next but to travel the world? Logan studied abroad. He studied a variety of crime fighting skills in his time. He studied criminology, forensics, martial arts, gymnastics, you name it. This guy learned all 127 major styles of combat. And yes, Thumb Wars is included. You never know, you never know. That mixed with Wolverine's abilities, I mean, you're screwed. Good game. Number seven, 1800s Batman. Batman Gotham by Gaslight, a tale of the Batman, written by Brian Augustin and brought to life by Mike Mignola. Here comes a tale from the Victorian era where Batman is hunting down Jack the Ripper. So it's 1889 and while these attacks are happening over and over, the general public is starting to whisper through the winds and talk amongst themselves in the shadows that maybe, just maybe, it's Batman who is committing these crimes because well, he's dressed like that. Pretty, pretty fair assumption. We love some Victorian drama. Let's get spooky. So we get historic killers here. We get old timey gangs. Bruce gets framed. It's an entirely new version of Batman, but it's an older take on the Cape Crusader. To see Batman purely rely on his detective skills more than anything makes for a really enjoyable story. I mean, there's no crazy gadgets or cool Batmobile that flicks him up a building. He's just like, I got it. I'm a detective. Let's do this. Steampunk Batman for the win. It got the feature film treatment in 2018 with Sam Liu directing. So if you're looking for an old timey superhero animated flick with Jack the Ripper, there you go. Just made your day. What do you know? Number six, Thomas Wayne. Coming from the Flashpoint storyline released back in 2011, written by Jeff Johns and Andy Kubert, Thomas Wayne, Bruce's father, was actually the one to become Batman in this timeline. Now in this universe, Bruce Wayne was the one who got shot that fateful night and he bit the bullet. The world of Flashpoint is this altered reality where Barry accidentally ends up in, where Batman is older and much, much more violent. And not so much as a detective like Bruce. See what happened was in this alternate reality, Bruce his mother, Martha, is so traumatized that she becomes the Joker. That's why during the opening credits of Batman vs Superman, we were all pumped in the theater because Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Lauren Cohen, two amazing actors, were in such a small opening scene as Bruce's parents with zero dialogue. Now with recent set photos of Michael Keaton and the new Flash movie, we're still in for a great time, but we were so close to the best Flash movie with Jeffrey Dean Morgan as a dark Thomas Wayne. Jeffrey Dean Morgan did say on Twitter that ever since Zack Snyder walked away, his whole bit in that world has walked away with him. But we still got Michael Keaton, so it's still fine. It's good, it's good. Number five. Red Death. Coming from the Dark Multiverse, Earth 52, first appearing in Dark Days, the casting issue one, Red Death Batman used to be a hero who fought alongside Robin in his world. The events that transpired in Batman's life were taking a harder toll on him. He was watching all these sidekicks just bite the bullet, so he was desperate to find this new power, a new way to get ahead of these horrible crimes. So he looked at his world's Flash. Batman honestly believed that he could use the Speed Force better than the Flash, so he took out all the Flash's villains, stole all their tech, and then he himself fought the Flash and he was winning. He drove the two of them into the Speed Force because he had merged his Batmobile with the Cosmic Treadmill. That's always fun. And then that's when he absorbed all of Barry's powers. He did it. After Batman came back from the Speed Force, he referred to himself as Batman the Red Death where he would easily and brutally kill Gotham's rogues. All the while, Barry's consciousness is begging him to stop inside of him. Uh, it's kind of like a nightmare, this version. Definitely a nightmare. Number four, Azrael. Right after the 1993 Nightfall story, when Batman got his back broken by Bane, just absolutely wrecked, he decided to pass the Batman mantle right on to not Dick Grayson. No, instead he chose Jean-Paul Valley, AKA Azrael. His run on Batman wasn't the same as Bruce's. I mean, for starters, Azrael's methods were pretty violent and quite irresponsible. In all fairness, he was capable of defeating Bane with this new tricked out bat suit, but this guy thought that he was actually an all round better Batman and a permanent successor rather than a replacement. Ooh, got news for you, pal. So once Bruce did recover, he had to force Azrael to leave the position. Even the style changes were quite drastic. Azrael made more than a few changes to the suit. Now it's black and yellow, this metallic armor, and then he added some other gadgets like claws, dual mag weapons, and of course, a cape. Just to, you know, because he's a hero, he needs a cape. Number three, Terry McGinnis. The year is 2039, and by this point, Bruce Wayne has retired from the crime-fighting life. 
But meanwhile, Project Cadmus director Amanda Waller was out in search of a replacement, beginning with Project Batman Beyond. A major key element was using Batman's blood samples left over from his altercations, the OG Batman. That, mixed with some nanotech solutions, we now can make the DNA of Bruce Wayne. The future, how lovely. So Amanda found the Warren McGinnis household with Warren and Mary, and the couple was psychologically identical to Thomas and Martha Wayne. Perfect. So when they thought they were going in for a flu shot, they didn't know they were actually about to be the new parents of a new Batman. Amanda almost had both of them taken out to, you know, encourage the lonely road of the Cape Crusader growing up, but thankfully she scrapped that idea. Because we don't need the same origin story, Amanda. Like, give the kid a minute to figure it out. Like, you know, just don't have to. We don't need to. Turns out you can't avoid fate still because down the road in Terry's teenage years, his father ended up getting killed and Terry believed that it was actually the corrupt CEO, Derek Powers, behind all of it. So he got the help of Bruce Wayne, who was part of the merger with Derek Powers, naturally. Then after facing off against the Joker's gang, Terry realized that Bruce was in fact this original Batman. So Terry stole his bat suit and was determined to find justice himself. The Beyond suit is just awesome. Rocket boots, claws, cloaking device. The red and black, I mean, you can't get any better than that. Number two, Batman. Coming from Earth 43, Batman is, well, he's just that. He's Batman who doubles down as a vampire. Nice. We see him for the first time in Batman and Dracula Red Rain. His origins are the same for the most part, how he became Batman because of his parents, huh, all that jazz. That's the same. But then when he's patrolling one night, he starts to find victims all with the same injury. Their throats have been just slashed apart. Who could have done this? Why, Dracula himself, that's who. He gets help from a rogue vampire named Tanya, who was once part of Dracula's posse. And Batman is so wild, this guy willingly gets bitten by a vampire to become one, so then he can take on Dracula. Whatever it takes to get the job done, I respect that a lot. And finally, number one. Batman, the god of all knowledge. The Mobius chair made its first appearance in New Gods issue one, and the chair itself was created by Mobius, AKA the Anti-Monitor. He gave the chair to Metron, but when Metron took his eye off the prize for a minute, Batman ended up becoming the god of all knowledge for a short time. What happened was Wonder Woman grabbed Metron with her lasso, yanked him right off, and then before boom tubes were summoned or anything like that, Batman just took that chance that he had and jumped on the chair. Musical chair style. Then the Dark Knight becomes the bright light. The whole team at this time is fighting Darkseid and Batman's just floating in the background just trying to figure out the universe. He's just searching for solutions via the cosmic realm. It's pretty spectacular. Things took a jump to overdrive when he also received a power ring. I thought he was a good detective before, but now, I mean, that's just, that's just OP. Number 10, Carter Slade. The original Ghost Rider was actually referred to as the Phantom Rider. Carter Slade made his first comic book appearance in Ghost Rider 1 way back in 1967. Born in Ohio in the mid 19th century, Carter had aspirations to become a teacher, so he rode from Ohio to Montana. But during this commute, he was shot by guys dressed up as Native Americans. They were a bunch of white dudes. All of them canceled, immediately canceled. Comics are very dated now, so things like this happen and you're like, Okay, let's just see where the story goes. A doctor named Flaming Star took Carter after that point and prayed, he chanted, he did everything he could to save his life. Now the secret ingredient was glowing dust from a shooting star that he had had from earlier and a special cape that he prepared. He saw the shooting star and knew that somebody important was going to come along. Okay, fair. Great call, Flaming Star, also great name. Carter's a pretty cool ghost rider. I mean, he carries with him these spirit guns, which are way more impressive than spirit fingers. Number nine. Johnny Blaze. Next on the list, we have Johnny Blaze, another OG Ghost Rider. He made his first debut in Marvel Spotlight issue five in 1971, so four years after Carter Slade. Johnny began his mortal days as a stunt performer. He was great at handling a motorcycle and Johnny became bound to Zarathos, the spirit of vengeance, after he made a deal with Mephisto to save his father, Crash Simpson's life. You know, one of those classic scenarios we all get into. So now Johnny Blaze and his hell cycle control hellfire and inflict it upon others that he deems evil with the help of his pen and stare. Nicolas Cage actually killed it as the Ghost Rider. I would not mind an older, crazier Nick Cage in the MCU. They can do it. Number eight. Caleb. Coming from Ghost Rider Trail of Tears issue one, Caleb and his family were attacked one night and Caleb was killed by George Regan and his gang. Not a pleasant time at all, not a good origin. 
But then cut to you two years later down the road, Caleb returns from the dead. Voila, how alarming. Brought back by some form of spirit of vengeance, in Trail of Tears issue two, Caleb's friend Travis Parham returns and finds Caleb in his new ability to control corpses and travel through dimensions via Hellfire. So things have changed for them. The unlikely duo work together tracking down other members of Regan's gang for, well, his death. They obviously wanted payback. Caleb is sick, he rides a flaming horse, and he's got a chain. He's got bling, bonus points for some devil bling. Number seven, Robbie Reyes. Making his first appearance in all new Ghost Rider issue one, Robbie was a young LA mechanic living in Hill Rock Heights. His area was full of gangs, so it wasn't exactly easy for him or his brother Gabriel. Now when Robbie heard of a street race offering the winner $50,000, he just had to compete. All that knowledge in cars, he's like, yo, I'm gonna smoke these fools. All that money too would get him and his brother out of there. So while he was winning, he was in first place during this race, he thought that cops were on his tail, so he booked it and eventually he hit a dead end. He got out to explain and whatnot and say, hey, sorry, I'm doing a race, trying to win some money. But then he realized they weren't in fact officers, but it was already too late. They opened fire on Robbie, and he unfortunately did not survive. When the attackers went to burn the car, cause evidence, they didn't realize that the car was possessed by a ghost, and that ghost possessed Robbie, making him a new ghost rider. And of course, he had to dish out some sweet payback. This guy's extremely powerful. I mean, in Avengers Volume 8, Issue 25, Robbie uses his chain manifestation, and it's so strong that it ripped a Celestial's arm right out of place. How wild is that? Number six, Danny Ketch. Danny came around in comics nearly 20 years after Johnny Blaze in Ghost Rider Volume 3, Issue 1. He was the son of Barton Blaze and Naomi Ketch. So when he was a teenager, Danny and his sister Barbara hit up a graveyard to get the real Halloween spooky vibe, let's do it, and also to take photos of Harry Houdini's grave. Those two things we always want to do on Halloween. While they were there, two gangs started to fight, one led by Death Watch and the other with henchmen of Kingpin. So Barbara shrieked in fear as everything went down, naturally so, Death Watch heard her, and then she was shot in the chest with an arrow, just horrible stuff. Danny grabbed her and took off. While he was catching his breath, figuring out what to do with his sister, he saw this beautiful motorbike with a glowing gas cap and touched it. He then became a ghost rider whose mission was to go after those who shed the blood of the innocent, such as his sister. Number five, Aleandra Jones. Entering Marvel Comics in Ghost Rider Volume 7, Aleandra was born and trained alongside other orphans in a temple with one specific goal in mind. Why to simply become one of the next Ghost Riders? Easy peasy. So when Johnny Blaze was convinced to give up the Ghost Rider curse, the Seeker was then resurrected to pick the next Ghost Rider. That's when Aleandra got her big break. She was first sent to Ohio to fight Scaddy, the Red Skull's daughter. She lost, but still, she jumped right into the action. It was happening for her. She was a very powerful Ghost Rider nonetheless, but her reign came to an end once Johnny realized that he goofed up and he got his status back. After that point, she was upset. She swore revenge on Johnny, of course, because I'd be upset too if I had that power, and then all of a sudden it was taken away from me because some other guy learned to lesson. I'd be like, great, I'm glad you're good. Can I still have that? Uh, hmm. Number four, Ghost Rider 2099. Kenshiro Cochran made his first appearance in Ghost Rider 2099, issue one, back in 1994. He was a hacker who rolled with a gang called the Hotwire Martyrs, residing in Transverse City. This gang was so badass, one day they stole encrypted data after hacking a fiber optic trunk line. Just as intense as a heist, for sure, just as badass. So while this was happening, in comes another gang, even more intimidating, called the Artificial Kids. The kids with a Z, of course, to make it cool. All these cool, nerdy gangs. They actually killed everyone. It was indeed a massacre. It was very intense. No jokes this time. Kenshiro, street name Zero, decided to transfer the encrypted file to his girlfriend during this, and at the same time, hack cyberspace to erase all his headwear implants. So Elon Musk's future is basically confirmed. We can look forward to that, nice. Then he wakes up in this new cyberspace called Ghostworks. Zero was sent back to the real world as their agent of change. The machines created a Cybertech 101 warbot, souped it up with nanotech weaponry, camo abilities, self-repair, and of course, a copy of Zero's personality downloaded into his neural net. Very futuristic, different version of Ghost Rider, but still counts. Number three, Red Hulk Ghost Rider. In the Circle of Four storyline, Captain America ordered General Ross to go after Venom, and while they went at it, Mephisto's kid, Blackheart, brought part of Hell back up to Earth. Lovely. This all takes place in Venom Volume 2, Issue 12. And it's great timing because Red Hulk made an alliance with Venom, X-23, and Ghost Rider. 
They were all actually killed in this battle. And then in hell, Mephisto did his thing and then offered the heroes another chance, all that devil stuff. And then all they had to do on their part was take down Blackheart. They got the spirit of vengeance and planned to get it to Johnny Blaze so he could become Ghost Rider again. So the Red Hulk at one point had the symbiote and the spirit. How intimidating is that? Number two, Frank Castle, AKA the writer coming from the pages of Thanos volume two, issue 13, the Thanos win storyline. So the Punisher actually died a pretty random way. A piece of debris from a building fell on him and then he ended up in hell. Okay, that's one way to go. He was pretty eager for revenge, so he signed up a few contracts with Mephisto, became the last Ghost Rider, and then headed back to the battle. Only the thing was, when he returned, the dust had already settled long before. Thanos was gone, the planet was empty, it was a wasteland. The new Ghost Rider was quite bored for many, many years. Even Mephisto stopped answering his calls and then he started losing his mind. Galactus then eventually came along and Ghost Rider offered the dead planet in exchange for another go at Thanos. So they traveled the cosmos together. How fun, little duo. They found Thanos, Thanos cut Galactus' head off and promised the Ghost Rider more evil than he could punish in a thousand lifetimes. So Ghost Rider became his servant for a bit in the comics. Shaking hands with all the devils now, eh Frank? Okay. And finally, number one. Ghost Spider. Coming from Earth 11638, AKA the perfect world, this Peter Parker has a much brighter beginning. Meaning Uncle Ben actually never passed away and gave the whole great responsibility speech. Instead, he just continues to encourage Peter to become a stronger Spider-Man as he gets older. A little pressure, okay, how does that affect this Peter Parker long-term though? Where's the butterfly effect difference in this universe with Uncle Ben being alive? Well, Uncle Ben pushes Peter to abduct Spider-Man from other worlds and absorb their life force via this portal that Parker Technologies proudly created. Now eventually our Earth 616 Spider-Man shows up, they fight it out, our Earth 616 Peter Parker comes out on top with the amazing spider getting his soul sucked into the machine. The perfect Spider-Man spirit was then trapped in the underworld and then from here it only gets more strange. Literally, Banner at this time was the current Sorcerer Supreme. So he freed that Peter in his astral form but Peter absorbed all these spirits of the damned while he was down there. So when he came back, he was now Ghost Spider. What a series of horrible but also cool events. Kicking off the list at number 10, The Nail. Created by Alan Davis, this version of Superman is Amish. Hot start, that's right. After he survived the destruction of Krypton, baby Kal-El was then sent to Earth in order to survive. The origin story for Superman gets a little strange when Martha and John Kent got a flat tire before departing for Smallville that day, hence the name The Nail. Now we're putting it together, there we go. So the lovebirds end up staying in for the night. Martha says she's in the mood just to stay home and John agrees. So now instead the super infant was found by an Amish couple. Now he's raised a good lad, but he's disconnected from the world. He's churning butter, not checking Twitter. He has no clue he's a Kryptonian. So in turn, we get to see a Justice League with no Superman, and the world is a hot mess. Lex salvaged Kal-El's spaceship after he landed, so he used that tech to create an evil version of Jimmy Olsen. But when Super Jimmy is fighting the Justice League, the fight moves to Amish Kal-El's backyard, and that's when he discovers his true powers. He always had a feeling he was super powered, he just didn't really know. So he bids farewell to his Amish folks, and then he unleashes the power of a god. What a day. Number nine, Injustice Superman. This comic run began back in 2013. Injustice Gods Among Us issue one, brought to us from the minds of Tom Taylor and Jeremy Rapak, comes this dark alternate reality where Lois Lane was kidnapped by the Joker. So he goes on this hunt with the help of the Justice League, tearing submarines apart, looking for his love, but as issue four begins, so do the streams of our tears. Lois Lane gets killed and in turn, Superman goes bat insane. He couldn't even stick around. He gave the body to Wonder Woman and then zoom, he just flew off. Green Lantern tried to talk to him a little bit saying, you know, you're hurt, you're angry, yada yada yada, just slow down. But Superman wasn't having it. He had something better on his mind. Batman's face says it all during this scene. Superman tells Batman during his dark ruling days that he learned the idea of enforcing peace through fear from Batman himself. Number eight, Kingdom Come Superman. 
Shifting over to an alternate reality with an older Justice League, this Superman isn't as ruthless, but take that with a grain of salt. Cal L of Earth 22 made his first punch into DC Comics with Kingdom Come issue one. Now this is a version where Lois Lane still did perish, only before her untimely demise, she made Superman promise to her that he would not kill the Joker in retaliation. So a little bit different this time. So he followed through and simply had the clown arrested. But this new superhero named Magog made their debut and then they in turn ended up killing the Joker. Magog was obviously put on trial because you know, killing's bad and all that stuff, but he was acquitted. The general public was like, oh the Joker? Yeah, that guy was horrible. Thanks, great work. I can take the bus without having a panic attack now. Lovely, sounds wonderful, keep it up. Superman had to then rethink a lot after this. I mean, the public is now okay with killing villains. What does this world even come to? He's been letting these guys live and in turn they've broken free over and over again and then continued killing innocents over and over again. So he then just disappears to the fortress of solitude for a bit, observing without intervening. Now he did return less than a decade later, but the world had fallen into a societal depression. So with a new suit, older Clark Kent returned to the league, ready to once again enforce a code of ethics. Number seven, Calvin Ellis. When a comic book hints at a past president of the United States, it's usually pretty comical. For example, in Harley Quinn and her gang of Harleys issue five, we meet Harley Sin and her father looks and acts a little bit like Donald Trump. It's a ride. Now Calvin Ellis, on the other hand, was written by Grant Morrison to be based off Barack Obama and Muhammad Ali. So a much better person and role model, I'd say, just right off the bat. Earth 23 Superman President Ellis made his first appearance in DC Comics with Final Crisis Issue 7. Cal L was raised by the Ellis family, teaching him to always stand up for himself no matter what and to fight for what he believes in no matter what bullies stand in your way. Little more optimistic and useful than the Amish family, I'd say, just a tad. Can I churn butter or can I like save people? No, just churning butter, all right, great. Number six, Ultraman. Coming from Earth 3, originally Earth 2 in the comics, Ultraman is the evil version of Superman. Always fun, even if it's dark. Appropriately named Clark Luthor, he gets more power the more kryptonite he's exposed to. So if you see him dipping some crystals and licking them, you know, you know, you gotta hit the deck. And the design is pretty much the same, only instead of a hopeful S on his chest, Ultraman rocks a U. The angrier Ultraman gets, the stronger he also gets. So usually a play on opposites are fun in comics. This one's just borderline terrifying. Number five, Red Sun Superman. Superman Red Sun was released in 2003 from the mind of Mark Miller, part of the Elseworlds imprint. And we ask, what if Superman had been raised in the Soviet Union? I just watched Black Widow, we saw like a Russian Captain America, great stuff. Now we're talking about Russian Superman. That's why we're here folks, let's do it. The ship lands on a Ukrainian collective farm instead of Texas, and this idea had been floating around in Miller's mind since he was a six-year-old. Back when he read Superman issue 300, it showed the USA and the USSR rushing to claim the fallen super sun when he landed in neutral waters. Now, Mark Miller always wondered what it would be like if the other guys ended up getting to him first, an idea that subsequently earned Miller an Eisner Award nomination in 2004 for Best Limited Series, so you must check it out. Number four, Superman Parallax. In Superman Volume 4, Issue 29, written by Keith Champagne, we see Superman on the search for missing children from Metropolis, but when Superman follows a lead, he's greeted from fear himself at an abandoned hospital. Parallax and Superman fight it out, but realizing he has has no other choice, Superman offers himself up to the Dark Force. The only being that can save Earth at this point after is Sinestro, a powerful alternate, perhaps one of the scariest. You be the judge. Number three, Lara Lane Kent Supergirl. This next version of Supes looks a lot like the version that we're going to get in the new Flash movie, so I had to throw her in there to get the gears spinning a bit. She's the daughter of Superman and Lois Lane. She appeared for the first time in Injustice Gods Among Us Year 3 storyline. Now, in Zack Snyder's Justice League, we learn that Lois Lane is indeed pregnant, and the following sequels would have shown us a world without Lois. So perhaps this Flash film will show us this bright alternate world where Batman has killed a Joker and Supergirl grows up with both of her parents' guidance. She looks pretty badass too. Now, these are just set photos, but the similarities are wild. To see for yourself, check out Injustice Year 3, starting with issue 6 or seven, I think she comes in around there. Number two, Superboy Prime. This version of Superman has more powers and less weaknesses. I'm talking immunity to kryptonite and magic. He first appeared in DC Comics Presents issue 87, where Kal-El landed on Earth and was discovered by Jerry and Naomi Kent while they were on a hike in the New England seacoast town. 
They named him Clark, although Clark Kent was the name of a popular comic book hero, Superman. So yeah, he already existed on this Earth Prime. Now Clark grew up and later attended a costume beach party, which I gotta say, tights plus sand. Really? It's not the best idea. I don't know. They went to get a glimpse of Haley's Comet by the beach. It sounds great. Clark even dressed up like Superboy, although he was being teased. And then all of a sudden, a tidal wave hits, a portal opens, and the Superman pops out from another dimension. Now, at the same time, Clark's powers manifested, and he quickly learned what to do with them in the moment. Superboy followed that Superman back into the portal to his reality. Unbeknownst to him, though, he would never come back. That is until he decides to later punch reality apart. Number one, Superman Prime. Superman of the 853rd century. He's literally a living extension of the sun at this point in time, so we gotta finish with him. He left Earth way back in the late 21st century once everybody he cared about passed away. Okay, he's like, oh, she's dead? Peace. What about the millions of others you could help? I don't know. There's other people. Meet other people. Go on Hinge. I don't know. He traveled beyond space and time after that, literally reaching heaven and hell, and he made his first appearance in DC 1 million issue 4. So after soaking up the sun for 15,000 years straight, Superman obtained new abilities. He's more powerful than the gravitational pull of a collapsing star, and is many, many times faster than the speed of light. He's so powerful that he has some energy to spare. One of those new abilities is to share his power with others. A small, small amount, but still, that's far beyond any other metahuman at that point ever. You thought Superman was godlike before. This guy can literally smell you across the universe. And that's not even a joke. It's called superhuman olfaction. It's a real thing. He can smell trouble across black holes. Yeah.